can't stand the loss of her now. Oh, man. Well, thanks for uh, coming today. It's a nice gravel ball. Um, despite the terrific weather out there, it's good to see a, a good crowd. Um, we do have a, a film that we're going to be showing on Friday. Um, I'll get the flag out there for it. But it's a, a film that's been picked out that uh, uh, goes well with the theme this week. It's a Polish film, and uh, Dr. Homer will be introducing it. It's uh, Sinos, uh, Drasmus. Uh, and if you're interested, you can sort of check out the, uh, um, the full description of it. You know, after all our films, it's going to be at 7 o'clock right here. Uh, and our speaker today uh, is a uh, great little introduction. Dr. Uh, Nathan Wood teaches history, specializes in uh, a number of different issues, but today is going to be focusing on modernization, issues of modernization. Uh, fresh back from uh, a semester in, in uh, Poland, and we still had some. We appreciate you coming in and talking to you about bicycles. Thank you. Thanks so much. It's terrific to be here. Uh, riding over, I realized that you know I'm talking about automobiles, and I tend to operate on the Toyota principle of uh, manufacturing, which is just in time. And uh, so, obviously, for them, it's about efficiency. For me, it's another polite way of just saying procrastination, I guess, and, and working until the very last minute on my project. I'm really excited to share, uh, for the first time, many of these uh, findings that I. Uh, discovered this last fall while doing research for my second book project, Backwardness and Rushing Forward, The Age of Speed in uh, Poland, tentative title. But the idea that I have about this, uh, this book project is to look at bicycles, automobiles, and airplanes as three interrelated and emblematic machines that people would use to imagine escaping from backwardness. I mean, what better way to, to rush forward than in the seat of a powerful, powerful machine? And so I'm investigating uh, the ways that s specialists, engineers, technicians, early adapters use these machines, tried to create these machines. I'm looking at how uh, clubs and associations try to promote them. I'm looking at uh, the popular press, popular reactions, artists' reactions, reactions in literature. Uh, and I'm just following these from their uh, beginning, more or less, in 1885 to the beginning of the Second World War. And every time I go back to Poland, I tell myself I'll do more on the interwar period, and I keep finding great stuff before the First World War. And I think you'll see that pattern maintains even, even today. Um, so on July 8, 1922, and just its fourth issue, the Polish magazine Auto, printed a lead story titled, Our Automotive Industry and the Politics, the Policies of the Government, that assailed the Polish government for its failure to support the development of roads and industry in the country, preferring instead to think of automobiles as a luxury, available exclusively to the most, most wealthy spheres. Continuing the quotation, in all cultured states of Western Europe as well as in America, the editors observed, the automobile has for some time now ceased to be considered a luxury item, but rather as one of the most important and valuable means to maintaining their current standard and promoting their further progress in culture as well as industrial growth and as a national treasure. In articulating this perspective, the editors of Auto made clear their correct understanding of promoting motorization in a modern Western society, as well as their concern about the Ministry of Military Affairs failure to invest properly in making Poland a hospitable place for automotive growth. Grasping this, however, did not prevent Auto, which was the organ of the exclusive Warsaw Automotive Club, from in large part perpetuating the same state of affairs. The club donated some of its funds to, to, to the state, even, to help build better roads. They knew that this was a problem. But they also regularly took the side of owners over chauffeurs and remained an elitist uh, publication. Neither the state nor the privileged few who owned automobiles succeeded in making them affordable or accessible to the masses. Bicycles and automobiles began as commodities for the elite, though in the West, at least, the new transportation technologies rapidly became more widespread during the period from their introduction in 1885 until 1939. Bicycles had become nearly ubiquitous in many Western cities before the Great War. Um, by 1908 in Stockholm, for example, there was one bicycle for every 10 citizens. 
uh, Denver experimented with uh, buying used bicycles and making them available to the population. And they noticed that the uh, usage of tram uh, streetcars plummeted because people could just use the bikes to get around, around the city. But uh, in Warsaw, in the same period, 1908, the, it was closer to one bicycle per 4,000 inhabitants. So uh, somehow these were not becoming as widespread uh, as, as in the West. Um, less than two decades later, there was one car per every 245 inhabitants in Warsaw. While in Paris, the ratio was 1 to 25. And if the statistics in the journals that I've been reading in the Polish press are to be trusted, 1 to 13 in the United States. Uh, so, in Poland, where the government insisted on seeing cars as luxury items and taxed them accordingly, automobile ownership actually declined in the 1930s. And only in 1939 did it match the figure that it had been in 1931. Of course, we had a Great Depression that factors in here. The Great Depression hits Poland later than it does, uh, say, here. Um, but the, it's still a problem with sort of widespread uh, adoption of the automobile. So, in my talk today, I'll consider several reasons why this was the case. Chief among these were the poor roads in the Polish lands and the expense of purchasing and producing these swift new machines. Uh, but as usual for my style of uh, historical research, I'm also going to pay a good deal of attention to discourses and the way that people talked about the problem and presented the problem. Uh, common, common discourses, particularly as articulated in the specialist and uh, popular press literature and popular culture. And here's part of my, my big argument. As, as literate participants in Western civilization, Polish elites were aware of the new technologies of the age. And uh, first adapters got them relatively quickly, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, people you know, elsewhere, uh, say, in Europe. They read specialist publications from France, Germany, and England. They created similar germ journals of their own. They joined cycling and motoring clubs. They followed the development of the new technologies with great interest. And whether under the rule of the partitioning powers or a new independent Polish state after the uh, Paris Peace Conference, they sought to popularize these machines <coughs> in the general public, particularly as construed along national lines. This sort of the sense that we as a Polish people, we as a nation, should adapt to these, these new technologies. They had grand dreams for the future, but these dreams were largely unfulfilled. When the age of speed comes tearing through on foreign-built machines, and without much, much infrastructure to, to uh, support it, one has a hard time steering its course. The best one can do is go along for the ride. And I'll try to develop this thesis uh, by, by, by the end. Uh, first, it's a pity that Anna was polite enough to write me and explain that she wasn't going to be able to make it today. But I, I'm going to use this wonderful photograph that you should recognize <laughs> from the Crease newsletter. Here's Anna Chinchala, age four. In, with her sister in their uncle Władek's uh, American car in Gdynia, the most modern city of Poland. Uh, this is the city that was built so that the Poles would have a shipping port. And there's a lot to yeah. have that car. Yeah, it's gorgeous, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Um, but this was actually not a very common sight. Gdynia was exceptional. Uncle Władek was exceptional. Um, Anna's father, who got a Chevrolet made in Poland, so with licensing, but made in Poland in 35, was exceptional. All right, the story should begin in 1885. 1885 was a momentous year in the history of personal mechanized movement. And that year, Karl Friedrich Benz, a gifted mechanic in Mannheim, Germany, built the first automobile, a tricycle with a three horsepower internal combustion engine of his own design. That same year, only 120 kilometers away, near Stuttgart, uh, and independently of Benz, Gottlieb Daimler and uh, Wilhelm Maybach also constructed uh, an automobile, uh, a mechanized, uh, self-propelled vehicle. This is it. Uh, I was absolutely delighted to find this uh, trolling around on, on the internet last night. Um, so this is the Heidwagen that they design. You can see it has training wheels, in a sense, here, and the internal combustion engine. The Daimler engines ended up, motors ended up being better than the Benz ones uh, over time. And of course, you know the Daimler and Benz in 26 joint forces to create Mercedes-Benz. Um, 
This is a story that's much uh, better known. And one of the points of my research, one of the points of my book, is uh, my sense that one of the fundamental experiences of modernity is the sensation of feeling behind. Uh, so you get a new uh, cell phone and, and, or a new computer and it's out of date. There's the sense that modernization always is rushing forward and we're striving to, to keep up, to catch up. Uh, typically, however, history of technology focuses on the firsts, the Wright brothers, uh, Ben, Steinler, Maybach, uh, the success stories. And what I'm trying to tell is the story of people who are sort of trying to keep up, uh, which I think has wider lessons, not just for people who are interested in this part of the world. Uh, in 1885, um, there was also another fundamental uh, tweaking of an invention. Of course, bicycles as such, they were often called velocipedes, uh, existed uh, at this time. And the, the ones that were most famous or infamous were the so-called penny farthings in English, right, with the large front wheel and the very small rear wheel, which were very dangerous you hit a bomb or, or kind of leaning over because you were way, way up there. And you needed, of course, that large wheel to, to make it worthwhile, to make the pedaling worthwhile. Um, and it was at that time that uh, John Starley, I think is his uh, first name, yeah, John Kemp Starley, designed the Rover Safety Bicycle, which more or less, less looks like the bike that I rode in on just a few minutes ago. Uh, you can see that this front wheel is a little bit larger, but the fundamental idea is the same with the chain to maximize or, or, or um, magnify the power to the rear rear wheel. Um, and it's, it's called the safety bicycle, of course, because it was uh, had a much lower center of gravity and was a lot easier to control. Uh, shortly thereafter, a Scotsman um, invented pneumatic tires, which was another ma major innovation to be able to have rubber airfield uh, tires. Uh, and Rover, uh, which was the first company in Coventry that really made this bike, uh, in Polish has actually become the word for bicycle. So Hlowka, uh with a W instead of a V, is the word for bicycle in Polish. So this is evidence of how um, significant this innovation was. Uh, this is a photograph um, from Nawenchów, which is a spa town near Lublin, Poland. That's about 150 kilometers from Warsaw. Uh, and the, the writer, uh, Bolesław Prus, uh, Alexander Bolwatsky was his real name, but his pen name, Bolesław Prus would, would uh, spend his summers there uh, on vacation. And this is a bicycle that's on display because famously he learned to ride a bike uh, there. And I'm not certain because I just have, a couple of weeks ago I spent a good week and a half translating uh, his article, I'll give you some quotations from that in just a moment about bicycles, and this one doesn't quite fit the description that I have in my mind, having translated his article about when he learned to ride a bike. But it's, it's possible that this is the kind of bike that he, that he philosophy that he learned to ride on. And, and there is one telling detail. He mentions that it looks like a mosquito, and this certainly does with the antennae uh, up here. And this, this was presumably, I'm not certain, you see I have a sort of light text there, a question mark, presumably built by uh, Boschkowski who was the person who lent Proust the bike and helped him to learn. Uh, so, I'll, I'd like to quote some passages from Proust's uh, wonderful text. I, I'm going to teach a class on this in the, in the fall, and I'm going to assign this text to my students, and I hope over time to translate more such texts and publish them, uh, translations of these texts. Uh, you've, if you've been to my talks before, I've talked about a, a crazy novel about a Polish inventor who invented airplanes. And uh, I've read another novella, I'll talk briefly about it today, about bicycles. And then this text here, hopefully I can assemble enough that people would be interested in uh, these translations. Um, so Proust begins this sort of rapturous article. He's really, really excited about bikes. He's just learned to ride. It took him about two arduous weeks. It was very painful, very difficult. He has scenes where he describes that he you know, walks up to the machine and it whips over and hits him in the legs and he's all sweaty and his underpants are torn and, and uh, <laughs> uh, he's riding down a hill. No, he's not even riding. He's walking alongside the bike just to get a sense of the feel and he, and he, and he goes too fast down the hill and he's running to keep up and he falls over and, and there are some Jews, he said, who young and old 
all got a kick out of that. All thought that was very funny because they saw him um, trying to master this machine. He was 44 at the time, uh, and he was very proud of himself and, and extremely enthusiastic about the potentialities uh, for this new machine. So, uh, I guess we can forgive him for hyperbole as he begins his article. There is in this city and even in this country a great crowd of cyclists, which furthermore is multiplying so rapidly that before one generation passes, every Varsovian will only use the narrow trousers, wear several honorary badges on his chest, and have a lot of blisters on the organs that directly interact with that <laughs> machine. Uh, Note it's plural, organs. Uh, um, He's referring to this, uh, the Warsaw uh, Society of Cyclists. I'll talk more about them. I had a really fun time reading about them uh, and riding on a Hercules bike, which was one of their favorite brands um, while I was in Warsaw this, this past fall. Uh, the, the university library is right near their old racetrack, Dynasty. Um, and here you see uh, this guy modeling the uniform of the, the uh, association of the society. They would often wear these uh, short trousers with uh, socks, sometimes spats. Um, and there were all sorts of rules. They had to have a, when they went out on rides, they had to wear the red, uh, yellow, and, and blue belt of the society. They had to wear a sharp gray uh, sports coat. Uh, caps were even uh, sort of specified in the rules. And they, gave themselves all sorts of badges for <laughs> this and that ride. Uh, so, the Velocipede, he says, has obtained tremendous popularity among us, perhaps thanks to the fact that it only requires healthy legs, and not exceptionally healthy ones at that. Already a good number do not consider riding on a Velocipede as something indecent. Street urchins no longer run after a speeding cyclist. Now the peasant no longer bids farewell when he sees one searching for a rod. Earlier in the text, he talks about peasants nicking their axes on them. The philosophy. Um, so he's clearly enthusiastic about um, what he sees as a miraculous invention in an age that no longer believes in miracles. This is a, a, an age of, of, sort of rationality and efficiency. Uh, and he talks about how one can buy a philosophy in installments. Pretty soon he figures we'll see him sold used on the street, one hand a pair of galoshes, another hand an old bicycle. In a word, the velocity will become an article of everyday use, like a watch, a piano, or Swedish matches. Uh, and as we know, it doesn't happen at least as quickly as he hopes, right, that so many people in the right bike. He ends the article, and so my, my readers, men and women alike, if you have the money, buy a bicycle. Don't think that it is of the devil. Don't be afraid of the rigors of learning to ride. Don't underestimate it as just a toy. But rather, learn to ride, and ride as often and as far from town as you can. In a very short time, your muscles will get thicker. You'll sleep better. Your appetite and good humor will return. You'll become a brave and courageous person. And you'll thank the author of this text that he so enthusiastically recommended it to you. <laughs> Believe me now on credit. Uh, that you'll find greater pleasure than you ever imagined, and energy that you never knew you had. Uh, I'd like to draw your attention to the language of uh, sort of capitalism, commodification, commerce here. Buying uh, bicycles in installments, um, used bicycles being sold by peddlers, uh, articles of everyday use, all of which are consumer goods. Uh, particularly Swedish matches, which are, you know, because of the uh, invention, you know, make lighting candles and, or, or other things, or cigarettes for that matter, much more efficient and effective. Note again, if you have the money, he says, buy a bicycle. And then finally, he continues his metaphor and says, believe me now, for now, on credit. Uh, so this is a person who is thoroughly uh, ensconced in the uh, sort of modern capitalist system. And he's promoting the bicycle as uh, a commodity. More than that, of course, because he's really excited about it. But, but I just wanted to draw your attention uh, to that aspect. Um, he also saw the bicycle as a way to sort of save the dissolute and depraved youth of the educated and um, uh, aristocratic classes, who he thinks are being spoiled by the 
temptations of the city, you know, playing guards, cards and drinking and, and uh, generally being depraved and degenerate. And he, he figures if you just get out on a bike, you'll, you'll take care of that. <laughs> Uh, yeah. What was that? I'm sorry. Bruce those organs. Yeah, yeah. Well, well put. Uh, so, um, of course, Bruce is not alone in connecting the bicycle to the modern world of efficiency, temporality, commerce, and um, sort of vigor. Uh, the magazine Cyclista, which I really, really enjoyed reading uh, last fall in Warsaw, uh, did a survey, which was also a very new idea of the fifth, some of the 50 greatest Polish writers. Uh, this included um, Mickiewicz, uh, uh, Władysław, not Tadeusz, so the son of the great uh, uh, Tadeusz uh, Mickiewicz, but also Sienkiewicz, uh, Henryk Sienkiewicz, uh, Alexander Świętokowski, and, and uh, other sort of writers who are more or less forgotten today, unless you specialize in this. Um, and some of them just said, you know, I don't know much about bikes, but Surveys, that's a really good idea, thanks. Thanks for asking. Uh, so this is clearly connected to sort of new modern ways of, of thinking and understanding uh, the population. I'd like to include a few citations from, from these uh, survey results. Estella was uh, the pen name of this woman, Józefa zeskuzewski uh, Kishanitska, who saw the bicycle as a sort of vehicle, pun intended, for promoting democracy. This idea that anyone can ride a bike, and when they do, they look the same. So there's this great line here, she says, uh, personal courage and courtesy, grace and refined movement are all lost on those two wheels. A postal carrier and a margrave can enter a competition, and no one knows who will win the palm of victory. With the philosophy, there's no sign of race. One doesn't worry about the external appearance. The practical slogan, time is money, rushes, rushes along briskly without asking who directs or rides it. Democracy should have a bicycle as its emblem. Uh, Marian Gavalevich. Of the bikes themselves, I have a better picture in mind. So he makes fun of cyclists. He says that he thinks that they look like cats hunting for mice and, and uh, beetles on their back. So the cats are this part of the body and the beetles are, are this part when their legs are churning around. But he says, okay, I like the bikes though. You guys look silly, but the bikes, I've got some hopes for them. When they cease to be just a familiar <coughs> story for sportsmen and become a practical source of locomotion for us, when I'll begin to see people who are obligated by time and punctuality, note again this uh, obsession with time and speed, uh, such as delivery people, postal carriers, shop workers with packages, office workers rushing to work, pupils speeding to forth, and so forth. That's when he, he feels that the bike will have arrived. Now, he says it's still too much of sort of an expensive plaything for, for the well-to-do. Viktor Gomovitsky agreed. The bicycle is assuredly one of the most amazing mechanical conceptions. It exudes the spirit of our times, which in every field seeks for maximum power and endurance from a minimum of resources and materials. But I do not think that today's bicycle has achieved its perfect form. It's still a bit too heavy, too temperamental, and too expensive. To achieve perfection, it also needs a better motor than what we have at present. These machines are, are all connected. People are not making hard and fast distinctions between bicycles, automobiles, and even airplanes. And the same people who invent engines for bicycles to make them more efficient, right? Create motorcycles and, and might end up working to build airplanes and then go back to cars or starting cars and end up in airplanes or, I mean, they're all interconnected at this time. He says, uh, to achieve perfection, it needs a better motor. Okay. It goes against nature for any proper person to be thrusting his knees toward his chin. A normal person has no need for it. But then again, there are no normal people in Europe today. So the world is rapidly changing. And most of these writers, when I looked up their biographies recently, most of them were born around the middle of the 19th century. So they're established figures. And almost all of them begins by saying, ah, oh, good question. To be honest, I've never ridden a bike. Or my doctor tells me I should ride a bike, but I haven't learned how to do it yet. Um, so that affects, of course, their perception of these, uh, these machines. Uh, Mitskevich, the son of, of the late uh, Tadeusz, I'm sorry, Adam, I said Tadeusz early, sorry, Adam, um, 
lived in Paris, like his father, in exile, right? And he's convinced that in 10 years, everyone who has a watch will have a bicycle. So again, conflating time and uh, the speed of this, this efficiency. Another writer who lived in Geneva comes to a similar conclusion. The question of cycling has long been a foregone conclusion. The bicycle has come to life. It has inserted itself into the needs of everyday life and has ceased to be a toy or exclusively limited to sport, such that in city literature it will assuredly take an equal place with horses, carriages, and automobiles. As yet, he says at the end, I've not been run over by a bicycle, so I wish them all the best. <laughs> Antoni Orbovsky counted it a virtue that the bicycle, the horse of the future, does not rear up hang its head down, nor make any moves with the intention of unseating the rider. The still steed does not threaten its voluntary rider with bruises, something which is, which is something that cannot be said of the horse of the past, against which I hold a personal <laughs> example of a grudge. Uh, so these riders uh, had a great time uh, sort of pontificating on the, the new machines of the age. I noted a theme. And this, that's this real interest in the future, and this I think underscores my larger thesis in my book project and that I hope to convey today, which is that particularly in a place like this where intellectuals and the elite, educated elite, technical and otherwise, are connected to Western civilization, they're part of it, but they're on its, sort of its fringe, um, they invest a lot of hope in things like this, just as uh, intellectuals in, in many instances invest a lot of hope in socialism. You consider that, that uh, socialist magazines were, uh, publications were almost always called forward. Uh, in Polish, Nabschut. Uh, in German, Favats. Uh, there's this obsession with, with uh, sort of using something to leap ahead. Uh, Mao talks about his great, great leap forward. So uh, I found it very interesting that when I read Zola, uh, who was also cited but a few weeks later, he wasn't so interested in the future. He was interested in the present and the past. And Zola says, uh, unfortunately I think I hid this slide here because I was worried I was proliferating too many, so I'll just summarize it. Zola says, uh, I regret I'm not 20 years younger um, because then I think I would really be a serious cyclist. But I do cycle, he says, uh, every morning, 15 to 20 uh, kilometers, and it's really refreshing. So it's very interesting that for Zola, the bicycle was grounded in sort of a, a past that he regrets he didn't have and a, and a present that was significant for him. Whereas for all of these writers, uh, there's hope and vision for the future. Now, don't get me wrong, that's an unfair sample size, I'm aware, and I could, I'm sure, find people from Paris or England who are e equally rapturous about the new machines and the future of the new machines. But uh, humor me, at least. I, I, this is a point that I think is significant. That, that People who are connected to Western civilization, part of it, but sort of on its periphery, tend to be more enthusiastic about the dreams for the future. All right, sadly, dreams are dashed, or at least delayed. In 1889, according to Bogdan Tuszynski, uh, specialist on cycling in Poland, history of cycling, uh, there were 600 cyclists in all of the Polish lands. Of those, 12 were women. In 1897, the Warsaw Society of Cyclists had, had not even 800 members. 1908, I've already given you the statistic. And it's really not until the 1920s that cycling really takes off. And in 23, they are granted full membership in the International Federation of Cycling. And by 24 already, they've won a silver medal, Poland's first Olympic medal. The Olympic Games, of course, were pretty relatively young at this point, right? Having begun in 18, 1896. Uh, so, uh, but, but you begin to see, uh, you know, it's really not until the 1920s. So those predictions were okay, but they just, I think, were, they came a little bit later. The results came a little bit later. Uh, 7,452 cycling clubs, not cyclists, but clubs, were in, the Pol in, in Poland up from 848 in 1919. So why? What are some of the reasons? Well, uh, Tuszynski says the partitioning powers didn't support it much. Sometimes they would send policemen out when the cycling clubs would go out on their rides to sort of tail them, go with them. Uh, roads were terrible. This is a major, major uh, factor in promoting this sport. And it's going to, of course, affect the growth of automobilism as well. 
uh, bicycles were too expensive. Uh, there were foreign companies who would come and sell them there, but there were no local factories producing economically competitive bicycles that ordinary people could afford. Uh, and Tushinsky goes on about societal backwardness. This is his idea, his term. He says, you know, peasants saw cyclists as the antichrist and they freaked out. Um, one of my dear, one of my, no, well, it's hard for, it's hard for us to forget what we already know. Uh, but my, my dear, dear friend, uh, Professor Krzysztof Zamorski in Krakow, uh, told me that when his father in rural uh, southern Poland, what had been Galicia, but, but uh, was part of Poland in, in, I think he says, 1920, when his father was a boy, and he first saw uh, a motorcycle sort of tearing through his uh, country town. He ran and hid. He was so terrified. And his parents didn't find him all day. So that they like searched all over for him and he was hiding somewhere. And he stayed there because he was so freaked out by this loud motorized uh, uh, machine. Um, to Tushinsky's list, I would add, Elitism, a lack of a strong middle class. And this basic pattern that happens a lot of times when something's new and novel. People get excited about it, they form a club, they buy it, they get it, and then after a while they realize, ugh, it kind of takes work to keep, keep this going or keep, keep promoting it. So I'm going to give some examples, uh, particularly of my uh, ideas here. So the black is mainly from Tushinsky, the red is what I, I'm adding. And I just want to talk briefly about the Warsaw Society of Cyclists, or WTC, founded in 1886. Uh, Count Edward Hrabowicki had come back from Paris, wanted to found a cycling club in Warsaw, got together with some buddies, including Count August Pototsky, uh, who is pictured here, and they formed Cyclista, I'm sorry, the Warsaw Society of Cyclists. Uh, they had to get the blessing of the Tsar Alexander III signed off on it. Uh, there was also a Russian cycling club parallel to the Warsaw Society of Cyclists. Um, and Nicholas II ended up being quite the aficionado of uh, bicycles. So the son of Alexander III was, was into that. Um, but you can see, I mean, this is a club whose founder and first president, and they kind of just alternated, took turns being the president for many years, were counts. I mean, these are aristocrats, right? Um, when it was time to build a clubhouse, <laughs> um, wealth, wealthy industrialists donated huge sums of money so that they could build this really, really nice house, uh, clubhouse in, in Warsaw. Just, if you, if you know Warsaw at all, it's, it's uh, right in the district called Powiśle, right by the river, right where there's a big steep hill that goes down near the river. And they built this uh, club called Dinasse, and they built a track there where they could race. And then inside they could play cards, but not just that, have carnival balls and do dancing and string quartets and, and um, plays and stuff like that. The, the publication, Cyclista, came out in 1895. And for the first three or four years, it was really, really excellent. It had very high quality articles, high quality illustrations. Uh, it wasn't just imported and sort of copied and translated from the West. There was plenty of that, but there was a lot of local content, local promotion of cycling, uh, interaction with the cycling clubs in uh, Lvov, Lemberg, or in Wuch, um, details about rides, details about the clubs. And then after a while, it changed its title to Sport. And it was all of a sudden about horse racing, for the most part. And this, this you know, was kind of a accepting a defeat. This, this idea that you had to go back to this old uh, elitist sport. And they still had sections about bikes, but it, was, it, it, it didn't get enough, uh, unfortunately. Uh, so they, the, ma the magazine tried to promote sport, particularly among uh, women. But of course, it was this sort of backhanded promotion. You know, women look great on bikes, so we'd like to have more of them riding them. Um, and they they were progressive in their in in the way that they would 
advocate new styles of dress, including removing corsets. So in this picture, that doesn't seem to have been the case. <laughs> but, but, uh, but, then, but they also sort of were uh, sexist and patronizing in the way that they, I mean, just using our modern conceptions, you know, may not be exactly uh, fair. And then this was a major part of it. I mean, I was surprised when I saw an article that said, um, Hyman on a bike, and I was like, oh my goodness, this is going to be pretty racy. And it turns out that it was just about uh, all the marriages of club members in the past month. So um, I was kind of disappointed. I thought it was going to be about you know, how riding a bike can. Uh, but no. <laughs> um, but, you know, death, death notices, marriage notices, and then, oh my goodness, this time of year or really late January, early February, they just got all excited about their big carnival ball and who showed up wearing what and who, when the, at 3 a.m. you have to take off the mask and you reveal who you are, so if you don't want that, you better leave before 3. And there were cute little stories about a guy who um, went on rides in the summer and then fell in love with this woman and he married her uh, in the spring and she said, it's me or the bike. <laughs> and, and he's like, really? And, uh, and so he says, okay, all right, fine, it's you. But then she was gone one day, and he saw his bike there, and he's like, mm. and he went on on a ride, and when he came back home with the bike, he was caught red-handed, and she freaked out and started crying, and he runs up and gives her a big kiss, and she's like, what are you doing? The doctor told me that if you rode a bike, you wouldn't be able to make love with me. You wouldn't be able to kiss me. You wouldn't be attracted to me. And he's like, oh, sweetie, I love you. I still love you. And I can ride a bike. So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Mitrov, Mitroslav Chorodinsky was the head honcho in the club. He was th their best cyclist. He was very famous for winning early races. And uh, he wrote a contribution about cycling in the city. You can see that there's this effort to reach out, to sort of convince ordinary people that it makes sense to cycle, even if they can't afford to join the club, which was expensive, and can't afford the shoes and the spats and the sports coat, and the time, frankly, to go to club meetings. Uh, he says, all right, the whole world adheres to the Anglo-American saying, time is money. Uh, if a person who has to make lots of trips around town would just take a piece of chalk in hand and add up all the kopecks he has to spend on trams and droshkies would quickly come to the surprising conclusion how much serious money he could save if he just used to steal steam. So he, he makes, I think, a, a good claim for riding bikes. Um, and then he gives, I'll give him some credit, some good suggestions for how to ride safely in the city. You know, stay to the ride, don't, don't ride between vehicles. But he also says, look great while you do it. Uh, Argyle's really highlight your calves. <laughs> and watch out for beggars who want you to hit them so that they can force you to pay up. <laughs> so it's still elitist uh, in, in its effort. So here's the last issue of sport. Really cool looking magazine. I love those vertical stripes. Tall, slender. All right. Uh, I've given myself very little time to talk about autobl automobilism. But it's the same story, more or less. I'll just give you some some other examples. Antonio Orwowski, we saw him earlier, he was the one who was talking about how uh, bicycles were the horse of the future. Um, today no young Varsovian envies anyone abroad, for here on our streets automobiles have appeared. The sport catches on with everyone, one glance and they're seeing stars, and this declining century, soon gone, will give way to the age of cars. 1899 excited about this. 1922, Henrik Czaplinski. I hope that in this field we'll soon overtake America. <laughs> All right, well basically America produced five-sixths of the world card, world's cars in the 19, by the late 1920s. This is largely due to Henry Ford and his uh, application of Taylor's principles. Um, but they accounted for, in Poland, 84%, no, I'm sorry, 64%. Oh, uh, yeah, 64% of all 
uh, automobiles that were in Poland. And frankly, one of the main reasons was because the roads were so bad, and American cars were actually tougher, and weren't, they weren't finely tuned sports cars in general, uh, like some of the European cars. Um, and uh, the cars that were also very popular in Poland were the Austro Daimler and the Lauten e Clement car, which was a Czech uh, car, because for a lot of the same reasons. Case automobiles, which we associate with tractors, were popular in Poland because they were sturdy and could handle the uh, rougher conditions. Um, but, you know, sorely disappointed if this guy thinks that Poland is going to overtake um, America. We've got fabulous automobile traffic in Warsaw. I admit it, the automobile has completely replaced the horse. Fables. Have you ever eaten a sausage made from an automobile? Uh, <laughs> gosh, I thought that would get a better... <laughs> Uh, a similar magazine from before the war was Lotniki Automobilista, absolutely wonderful publication, tries to popularize automobilism and aviation. Um, mixed, mixed results. There are lots of the foreign influences. Here's the Lauren E. Clement automobile that I was talking about, uh, called Atlanta, again, sort of a Western reference. Here's Ford. Uh, and Who's this? Michelin. Yeah, Bibendum, the Michelin Man. And I love how he's seated on the roof of the uh, Paris Auto Exhibition, um, smoking a cigar, changing tires, <laughs> and all the other little cars are clustered at his feet like puppies, just waiting for their turn. Um, but it's really fascinating, actually, to read these uh, papers and see how ubiquitous companies that we still know today were at that time. Uh, Bosch, which had a Bosch dishwasher, and Bosch was famous for its automobile components. Continental tires and continental fabrics were used for airplanes. Um, one of the magazines that I read from the 1920s and 30s, Auto e Sport, Auto and Sport, didn't take much to translate um, that title. It was basically underwritten by Dunlop. And so if it wasn't an article about Dunlop tires, it was an article about Dunlop tennis rackets. So there, there's this clear influence of these uh, Western companies. Um, school for chauffeurs. The, the, the aristocrats who got really excited about these new machines tried to promote them. And this was offering free classes to train drivers. Basically, these rich people needed people to drive them around. And so uh, they had these chauffeur classes where people could learn how to, uh, to drive cars. Though in this illustration, which is wonderful, graphically speaking, it looks like they're doing some lunar driving. <laughs> uh, a school for chauffeurs. Um, note, a woman driver. I've used this illustration before here in a, in a, in a brown bag. But again, is this just for the lead? Here's the German uh, automobile company, NIG, and uh, this is not the sort of thing that ordinary people sort of lifestyle that they, they can expect. <laughs> and nor is going wolf hunting on your uh, estate <laughs> or playing polo. So these machines are still, I think the readership is still very much ensconced in its insular elite culture. They're trying to reach out. They're trying to say, why aren't more middle class people driving cars? Or why aren't more women riding bikes or driving cars? Um, but they're also very exclusive. Sport and caricature. Again, a bunch of uh, middle class athletes. They don't look like uh, athletes of today, finely tuned machines, if you will. And there was a major divide between cities and uh, countryside. Why are you so amused? Where have you been? I drove my car 70 versts in 27 minutes, crashed two wagons and ran over a cow and three or four people. I'm telling you, delicious fun. Uh, this was a per perception that this was published in a popular illustrated journal, the most popular illustrated journal of the day. And so this was a perception that automobilists were jerks, right? That, that you know, they were out there to have fun and pursue speed, and they didn't care too much about the results. And amazingly, the story that I read about bicycles that was published in the Bicycling Magazine, written by yet another count, a uh, nobleman, right, called Bicycle, the Bicycle. The basic storyline is that uh, 
50-something widower wants to get married. So he goes to Warsaw uh, and asks his friend, who's a member of the WTC, the cycling club, if he knows any women who might be interested. And they're like, oh, we've got just the person. And they want to get rid of this woman who is an enthusiast of cycling, but who's a real pest around the club. And so they're really excited when they get married, because she's got a good dowry. And he goes out into the countryside, and she is quite the shock to the countryside. She brings all her, her bicycles. Um, this, the author is really cruel. He has so much fun coming up with all sorts of ways for saying that she's overweight. Uh, throughout the story, even though she's a cyclist. Um, and then the, the husband is feeling just so frustrated by his new situation. She's actually being sneaky and not giving him all the dowry that he thought he was going to get. And he goes out for a ride in the country. And he's screaming along on his, on his bicycle. And he hits a peasant child and kills it. And the consequences sort of eventually follow from that. And I just remember reading it this summer and thinking, really? This is the story that you're going to publish in the magazine where you're trying to promote cycling, in the specialist mag magazine about, about cycling. And he is utterly callous. None of the lead characters in the story are at all attractive. They're all sort of morally suspect. Uh, so, yeah, I don't have much time to talk about that. Here we have the Austro Daimler car, ideal car for our yeah. roads, ideal yeah. automobile for our, our roads. And you see just, you know, the, the countryside, and then this modern machine tearing through. This is a famous po a Polish uh, painter, Wojciech Kosak, who was famous for his paintings of horses. He was very well known as a really good painter of horses. And it cracks me up to no end that he was commissioned to paint a painting for the, Fiat, the Polski Fiat uh, 300. Uh, which was a Polish licensed, licensed and built Fiat in the early 1930s. And um, you're like, yeah, he's famous. Let's get him to do the painting for our, for our car. And, uh, and there it is, uh, being outrun by a uh, peasant horse car in the mountains. Uh, so, big, big, big picture, pulling things together. Backwardness and rushing forward. Again, in the West, they maintain that time is money. Uh, while it seems for us that time still has very little value, yet there will come a time of change in which rapid locomotion will become immensely valuable, just as it already is abroad, and perhaps even more so, for the automobile offers us the unusual advantage of eliminating, in many instances, the need for greater rail networks by converting our homes into personal main stations. So again, this is that leap forward I was telling you about. We don't have a good rail network, but if we just adapt cars, we can skip it. Just like in Africa, they skipped the wired telephones and went straight to, to cellular. Uh, so this is a good idea. Um, but um, it, didn't, it didn't work. I mean, my, my, my feeling, reading all and studying all these, is that <coughs> people still sort of felt left behind. And there's a classic pose that uh, pilots had, which is looking over the shoulder. It makes sense to me for practical reasons. It's hard to photograph a pilot from the front because the propeller is in the way. But I think that this is a metaphor, this idea of leaders looking over their shoulders at us as we try to keep up backwardness and rushing forward, or as we gaze lustfully from the rear uh, at, at this, uh, this woman on her, her uh, French uh, uh, tricycle. Motorcycle, tricycle. Um, and then here's another ad for De Dion Bouton, one of the early uh, automobile manufacturers in France. And I want to draw your attention to this, again, this idea of sort of dreams, aspiration, in this case, even uh, sort of lust. Here is the new modern man in his automobile, and he has a naked woman going with him. Uh, and these modern men, uh, but they're still kind of behind the times because this guy's on a bicycle and this guy's on a horse, are racing afterwards. They're trying to keep up with, with what's desirable about this uh, sort of onward rush to the future. These people 
are the onlookers. They are actually looking at, a, at this scene. And we are third time or fourth time removed. We sort of watch with desire, but we're still sort of behind. So that's my big thesis. I left you four minutes, six minutes to uh, ask me questions. Thanks for humoring me. I appreciate your attention.